stone, a bluish sapphire stone. Now, everything that I've told you up to this point is totally biblical, but there is really good evidence, I believe, to strongly suggest that the first set of Ten Commandments that Moses got from God that were written by God on tablets of stone were carved out of that blue sapphire stone, taken, as it were, right from the throne of God. <coughs> And that the Jews widely understood this. It's a very good, and this is a corroborating evidence. And uh, if you're interested in that, you can just Google my sermon on that. It's called The Blue Stone. Uh, it's on YouTube. But th th here's a really good piece of corroborating evidence. When God says, hey, make a tassel on the corners of your garments to remind you of the commandments, why is it blue? It's blue because there was a widespread Jewish understanding that the commandments were blue. They were literally carved, not out of granite, not out of some slate or basalt. They were carved out of the very blue sapphire stone that came from the throne of God. They were then placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Of course, the first set was broken, and a second set was carved that very likely was not out of the sapphire stone. But the Jews would have known, hey, that first set, that was on blue stone. So, so Moses is like, when God speaks to, to Moses, he says, tell the children of Israel when they make their skirts and dresses, to put a blue hem around the bottom to remind them of the commandments so they don't become harlots. Now, this is so interesting because check this out. This, is, this chapter here, is, uh, Exodus chapter 28, describes the clothes that the high priest would wear. When the clothes were being made for the high priest that would minister in the sanctuary, God gave explicit instructions as to what those clothes should look like. And he says here in, in Exodus chapter 20, 28, you can read the whole chapter, but I'll just give you a couple snippets. They shall take gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Notice those colors, four colors, gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine linen, and they will make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen artistically worked. Here's another one. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. Okay, what this is, is this was a, this was basically a, like um, a piece of, it was a, it was a, it was a gold sign is what it was. Okay? It was a gold sign. I'll show you. I'll see if I can do this real quick. Okay. It was a gold sign. Imagine that's a piece of gold sign that was placed, as you're going to see here, on the front of the, the hat that the high priest wore, and it went over his forehead, just like that. Okay? And it said, You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of a signet, holiness to Yahweh. Literally, there's just two words there, and it is Kadesh Yahweh. Holy Yahweh. And it goes, look at this, where it goes, you shall put it on a blue cord, so holiness Yahweh is suspended on a blue cord that it may be on the turban or the hat that the high priest wears, and it will be on the front of the turban. I think I've got another slide here to this effect. So it shall be on Aaron's forehead. Okay, this should be registering with some of you already. It will be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things with the children of Israel hallow and all their holy gifts. And it shall always be on his forehead that he may be accepted before the Lord. So when the clothes were made for the high priest, there was gold, purple, scarlet, and blue. And then there was something on his forehead, holiness to Yahweh. Okay, well, check this out. Look at Revelation 17. Look at what this woman is wearing and what's on her forehead. Revelation 17. Look at what she is wearing. Not only is she a church, not only is she unfaithful, but look at this. How is she dressed? Verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple, check, scarlet, check, gold, check, and precious stones, having in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations of the filthiness of, the, of fornication, and on her head was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. There is also something on her forehead, but it's not holiness to Yahweh. It's harlotry, mystery, Babylon the Great. Now, when we read those colors there in 17.4, what color was conspicuously absent? There's no blue there. She's forgotten the commandments. She's forgotten the law. She's forgotten the holiness of Yahweh, and this forehead thing is very important. We see this in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, in Revelation 7 and in Revelation 14, the people of God are sealed in their foreheads. And there have been some really zany ideas down through the, you know, like there's going to be a tattoo on the forehead, there's going to be like a chip in the forehead, you know, just crazy stuff. No, straight out of the Old Testament, what this means is really simple. This is how you think. This is what's in your brain. We now know what the ancients may not have known because they didn't have access to modern neurology, but your cerebral cortex is where the thing that makes you, you is located, right here in the front of your brain. 
right? And the closest location is the forehead. And what the high priest wore was, hey, look, holiness to Yahweh. As a representative of Jesus, what's in his brain, what's in his head is the goodness of God, the holiness of God, the love of God, the otherness of God. This woman has something in her brain too, and it is harlotry, it is fornication, it is illegitimacy. She is dressed like a high priest. She's dressed like a priest. She is purporting to occupy a mediatorial role, a priestly role, but she's forgotten the blue. The very thing, John is intentional with this, the very thing that God had said, make sure you put a hem of blue on your garment so you don't forget the commandments and turn into a harlot. Again, no one could have made this up. No one could have made this up. Hans LaRundell, the conclusion that the symbolic prostitute represents the apostate church is shocking. It is shocking. It requires confirmation from the biblical context. Such a validation comes in essence from the Old Testament prophets that portrayed Israel or Judah as a prostitute, the unfaithful woman of Yahweh. Now, we've got about 10 more minutes here for this first session and we'll wrap it up. We've already discussed in here that the history of the church can be communicated in about 30 seconds, okay? It was formed by Jesus, deformed in the medieval period, reformed during the Protestant Reformation, and is in the process of being restored even now as the Protestant Reformation marches on. So that's church history right there in basically 30 seconds. Formation by Christ, deformation in the medieval period, when persecution and superstition and the traditions of man held sway, that's the 1260 year period. Then Reformation with Martin Luther, and I've already mentioned to you that next year, to, uh, 2017 is the 500 year anniversary of the nailing of the theses of protest on the Durit, uh, Durit Wittenberg. I just heard this week that there are going to be 300,000 people basically a day visiting Wittenberg next year in the months of May, June, July, and August. So if you have any hopes or aspirations of going, good luck with that. Okay? People are going to celebrate the 500 year anniversary of the reformation of the church. Now, it's not easy as any historian will tell you or as anybody who's read a lot of history. There are some dates in history that are really easy, really well defined. Like we know that the uh, Declaration of Independence was signed July 4, 1776. We get that. But not all history is like that. History is, it flows. It's like a river. It's not like a well-defined pond. It's a river. And there, it goes around that rock and that eddy and under that bank and etc. So uh, it's, it's not always easy to attach very precise dates. You can in many instances of history. But when you look at the formation of the church, basically what you have is the arrival of Jesus, which takes place in about 4 BC, and any of those dates would be plausible for the end of the formation of the church. Let me just walk you through each of them briefly. AD 312 was the conversion of Constantine, the first Roman emperor. We've talked about how we're now living in the Constantinian era. So you could make a case that that was the end of the formation of the church, right? C conversion of Constantine. AD 325 was when Constantine conver convened the first council in in Nicaea. All the churches came together, and you could say, you know, that was really it. That's when church and state got together and started making creeds and then imposing them on others. You could say, no, AD 476, that was the demise of the Western Roman Empire, and that was when the Roman church came to prominence. So maybe that could, the case could be made. A very good case can be made for AD 538 was when the, the opposition to the Church of Rome uh, was finally removed, and the Church of Rome was declared by the Emperor Justinian as the official persecutor of heretics. So whether you want to take 312, 325, 476, or 538, you knock yourself out. What you have is a period where the church was formed in apostolic purity, but then slowly began to lose that apostolic purity until we get to this period of deformation. Now that period of deformation begins, I'll ju I've just chosen the latter date there, AD 538, which I think is a very good date. It's my actually preferred date. And then can go to any other number of dates. You could choose AD 1331, which was the birth of John Wycliffe, who was the morning star of the Reformation, uh, who began to say, hey, I, I, what's going on with the church is not what's going on in the Bible. Or you could choose 1517, as we mentioned, the day that, the, the year that Luther nailed the theses of protest to the door at Wittenberg. Or you could choose 1798, when Berthier, the the general of Napoleon went into uh, Rome and took the Pope off of his throne and declared uh, the, the Vatican the, uh, the, uh, the, the Vatican finished and the uh, 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 resources of the Vatican the property of France. Okay, so, so it's, it's liquid. History is liquid, but however you slice and dice the exact dates, there's no question that what we're dealing with here is the church was formed in apostolic purity, deformed through the medieval period with the mingling of church and state, reformed 
as the Protestant reformers began to say sola scriptura, don't tell me about your councils, don't tell me about your creeds, don't tell me about your cardinals, don't tell me about your traditions, don't tell me about your popes, tell me what scripture says. And we are living now, as you notice there, in the Reformation, in the Restoration periods. The Church of Christ has unwittingly repeated the history of ancient Israel. Just as ancient Israel was a harlot, the Church of Christ, which is astonishing. That's why John's like, what? What? You can understand why John would marvel at that. He'd be like, what? As he looks down through the corridors of time, he sees that the church will become the greatest enemy of the people of God on earth. I want to say that again. As John looks down through the corridors of time, he sees that the church, the professed church of God, becomes the greatest enemy of God and of the gospel on earth. So you can understand why John who knew that 11 of the, uh, 10 of the, of the disciples had laid down their lives as martyrs. He was the last living apostle here in, on the island of Patmos, and he is devastated. That would be an understatement. He's absolutely devastated that the church is going to meet a very similar fate to the fate of Israel. So he's just, it says he wandered with great amazement. He couldn't believe what he was seeing, and then the angel wonders at his wondering, marvels at his marveling, is surprised at his surprise. Hey, man, this is a repeat of what we've already seen. The enemy... Satan is, is an antagonism with God. And if you want to get to somebody, you go after their children. That's how you get to them. You go after their children, and that's exactly what has taken place here. So I'll repeat these together. The Church of Christ has unwittingly repeated the history of ancient Israel, which was by and large a history of apostasy and of unfaithfulness. If you've read the Old Testament, you know that. We've mentioned the counterfeit theme in Revelation, how God has an authentic article and then there's a counterfeit. Babylon, Jerusalem with women as symbols, the dragon versus the father, the antichrist versus the Christ, the false prophet versus the Holy Spirit, the unholy trinity versus the Godhead. And then this one is key, the mark of the beast and the seal of God. Just as Aaron had something on his forehead, holiness to Yahweh, and just as the woman has something on her forehead, mystery Babylon the great, the mother of harlots, the people of God at the end of time are said to have something on their forehead, which is called the seal of God, and the, those that align themselves against God are said to have something on their forehead called the mark of the beast. Okay, these are not tattoos or electronic chips or whatever. These are the thinking, the processing, the way that these people think the way that they interact. In Revelation, we are not confronted with some strange conspiracy that revolves around having inside information with the Illuminati or the Pentagon or the Vatican or some other foolishness. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is a big, big picture that basically says there are two ways of doing reality, love or force. There are two ways of doing reality, liberty or, co or coercion. There are two ways of doing reality, manipulation or freedom. God rules by freedom, God rules by love, God rules by trust, but what we see is that in the book of Revelation, coercive power has its limits. And those, that the, the coercive power finds its logical end point when basically what we see in Revelation is that people are told that if they don't worship in a certain way, behave in a certain way, think a certain way, or, or live in a certain way, that they will be, eat, first of all, economically punished and then killed. Now that seems impossible to us maybe today. But if that seems impossible to you, that's just because you are a child of modernity and you just don't know enough about human history. I don't say that to insult your intelligence. I say that to try and thwart this, this security that we feel in the midst of mod modernity that these things could never happen again. I remind you that the Holocaust is like 60 years ago, right? These are not ancient events. In fact, the, the picture and the portrait of what's going to happen at the end of time in Revelation is clearly described, and only in about the last 200 years of relative tolerance ha have we come, somehow come to convince ourselves that church and state could never get together again and impose religious totalitarianism, but Scripture says it will happen. There are actually really good evidences that it's already beginning to happen. So what we have with the seal of God and the mark of the beast is fascinating. The mark of the beast goes something like this. If you don't receive this mark, you will receive our wrath. Follow this. If you don't receive this mark of loyalty and of worship, you will receive the wrath. First, the wrath is economic sanctions, and then it's pain of death. Okay, that's an interesting thing. Get the mark, you're protected from wrath. The seal of God is the exact same thing. If you receive the seal of God, you are protected from the wrath of the beast, but you are not, pro you, you are protected from the wrath of God, but not necessarily from the wrath of, be of the beast. In Revelation 7, the people that have the seal of God are shielded from wrath. 
In Revelation 13, those that receive the mark are shielded from wrath. Now, this just asks a very simple question. Whose wrath would you be more afraid of? Right? Which would be just on a, on a very simple logical basis, the one that you would be more concerned about? The wrath of a, a religio-political power or the wrath of God? Okay, so choose wisely. <laughs> one of the markers of this power is that he would think to change times and laws. Revelation chapter 7, verse 25. He will think to change times and laws, and this is what has happened. The Sabbath has been lost sight of. The sanctuary has been obscured. The Sabbath is God's covenantal sign which identifies the worshipers of the true God, the Creator. That's why the Sabbath is so significant in Revelation, and we've seen it again and again. The Sabbath, is called, the Sabbath is called God's covenant, and it is in the heart of the Ten Commandments, which is also called His covenant. It was placed in the box, the Ark of the Covenant. Astonishingly, that covenant sign, the Sabbath, has been, quote, changed by the fallen church, and very few people are aware of it, right? There's a supposed change that has taken place, and the, the history behind that change is a fascinating one, and I'll give you the very brief version of it. When Constantine was con converted in AD 312, his empire, Rome, was largely pagan, and they worshipped the venerable on the venerable day of the sun. That's what we now know as Sun Day. Okay? In order to conciliate the pagans and the Christians in his diverse empire, what he did was he amalgamated the Christian and the pagan festivals, and there was almost no objection from the church. The reason there was no objection from the church, and this is really, this is one of the great sadnesses of the early church, there were very few Jer Jews in the early church. Almost all of the early church fathers were Greek. And if they weren't Greek, they were not Jewish. Very few were Jewish. Very few of them even spoke Hebrew. I think I've said this in this church before, but I'll say it again very briefly. To understand the relationship that the apostolic church had to Judaism and to understand the relationship that the later church had to Judaism is to understand it like this. The apostolic church, Peter and John and others, they related to Judaism like their mother. Judaism was their mother. They came from their mother. There was great uh, tenderness and, and empathy and love for their mother. But the later church, who had almost no Jewish presence in it at all, related to Judaism like their mother-in-law. <laughs> Difference? So when Constantine is like, hey, we're going to combine these festivals together, we're going to get rid of that old Jewish Sabbath thing, and we're going to do this venerable day of the sun, the church was like, yeah, sweet. Sweet, sweet as. That'd be great. Let's do it. So that's what's taking place here. The, the, the covenant sign has literally been changed. I want to close with a quotation that I just read yesterday from my good friend Ty Gibson, who also did this seminar. And then we'll take a break and come back. The climactic controversy of human history will center on the law of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. With concentrated attention on the Sabbath as a sign of the gospel contained in the law itself. God's ultimate plan is to inscribe his law on the hearts and minds of human beings. Amen. Thus restoring his self-giving love as the settled and sealed principle of their lives. Hallelujah. The Sabbath is the one commandment of the ten that identifies the author of the covenant as both the creator of heaven and earth and the redeemer of fallen humanity. Okay. The Sabbath is divinely, a divinely established reminder that our salvation is 100% the gift of God's grace. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. To totally his accomplishment in Christ to be, to be received into our lives by faith alone. The Sabbath is therefore designated in Scripture as the sign of the Holy Covenant, for it points to God's grace through faith as the only means of human salvation. And it is for this reason that the Sabbath, the Sabbath is in the crosshairs of the devil's rage. He knows that the Sabbath, when rightly understood, points to the gospel, the covenant of grace. God is creator, God is redeemer. So what we're not dealing with here is simply a matter of days. We're dealing with ways of viewing God, ways of relating to reality, and what is truly the person that we are. Are we a person that has in our forehead holiness to Yahweh? I want to live for God. I want, he's done so much for me, and I voluntarily, out of love and trust and attraction, want my heart and my life and my relationships to be holiness to Yahweh. That's one option. The other option is to have in our foreheads, now whatever I need to get by. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Coercion, manipulation, fear, force. And there's going to be a whole lot of people, in fact, I hope there are none in this room, but it is a sad tragedy that there are a lot of people, even in the Christian faith, even in my own church, whose primary uh, motive in their religious experience is fear. 
And friends, I just want to tell you today that fear is an imperfect and impure motivator. Fear can get you started. It can get you beginning to run the race. But fear is a pedestrian, an adolescent, an immature motivator. The great motivator is not a fear of hell or a fear of condemnation or a fear of being lost or a fear of any judgment. The great motivator is a love for God because he is so awesome and supremely attractive. When fear is used as a motivator, you can only get so much traction out of fear, but out of love, it's limitless. Fear has its limitations. Coercion has its limitations. Manipulation has its limitations. Love does not. Trust does not. And God invites us into a relationship of love and trust. This is why, as we have seen, the Sabbath is so centrally significant in not only Scripture, but in the book of Revelation. We've, read, we've been through these. Yeah, there's no way I could have never gotten. Let me just show you all the slides you didn't get to see. <laughs> you didn't get this one. You didn't get this one or 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 this. I told you this was going to happen. Okay, there it is. You didn't get all those slides. Actually, we did pretty good. Come to Revelation chapter 18, and we end here. This part that we skipped, just so you know, is verses 8 to 18 of Revelation 17. Revelation 17, 8 to 18, we skipped it, not because I don't understand it, I think I do, but because the last time I tried to present it publicly, it turned into an unmitigated disaster because it's really hard to present publicly. So if you're interested, I can tell you where you can go listen to that unmitigated disaster of a sermon and you can at least get the data, but I wasn't gonna make the same mistake twice. So basically it just describes, the, the, I'll give you the very short version. This is what I said last time and then it turned into a really bad version, but I will give you the short version. It describes the history of the satanic attack against God's people through the ages. And it's kind of complicated. That's the bottom line. But then you get to Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. After these things... I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. Ah, bringing lights, just like the woman, sun, moon, stars, illumined. Watch this. He cried mightily with a loud voice. Wow, this is a voice that everybody needs to hear. This is a loud, mighty call. Check this out. Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen. Not because of an in external imposition of God's insistence, but because the implosion of power, power, tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is an unsustainable system. It cannot be eternally perpetuated. It collapses in on itself. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, because of the internal principles of Babylon itself, watch this, has become a dwelling place of demons and a cage for every foul spirit and a, a, a place of, of every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. They've denied Sabbath. They've denied sanctuary. They've bought into an earthly priesthood, an earthly sanctuary. They've turned away from the true priest and the heavenly sanctuary. They've bought into it. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her delicacies. That's another thing that we've not got into, and it's what happens in much of rest, the rest of Revelation. But this illegitimate economic interaction, don't have time to get into it, but I want you to see verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, and I love this, this is probably my favorite verse in Revelation, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. That's proof that the plagues have not yet fallen. I love this. This is the last exodus. I love the idea that just as in ancient Babylon, as in Neo-Babylon rather, God's people were called out of Babylon to establish true worship. They rebuilt the city, they rebuilt the temple. Here in Revelation, God's people are called out of Babylon. Not just out of Babylon geographically, this is key, but out of Babylon emotionally, psychologically to not relate to others or to God in that way, but to say, I want to relate to others and I want to relate to God on the principle that we talked about yesterday. What's the trunk? What's this? This is love, and then this is supreme love for God, and then genuine love for mankind as exemplified in the Ten Commandments. Okay? That, that's what's taking place here, and God is saying, come out of her, my people. That system is doomed to implode, not explode, implode. That system is imploding. Come out. Come out, this is the time, because plagues are coming. She, she's going to reap the harvest that she has sown. This is a time to come out. And just as in Exodus, where the people came out of Egypt, and just as in the Old Testament, where the Israel and Judah came out, or especially Judah came out of Babylon, and in a really kind of cool way, just as in the times of Jesus, where the apostles were called out of apostate Judaism, at the end, God will be calling his people, hey, come out of that. 
come out of that whole big messy system that operates on coercion, fornication, illegitimate governmental, economic uh, interactions, that has forgotten the sanctuary, that operates on fear, that has an earthly priesthood, come out of all of it and come over here. The, 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 the message is not only to come out, it's to come in, and what you come into is this woman here, the people of God that was clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. God is calling his people out of something, but not just out for out's sake. He's calling them into something, and we'll talk about what he's calling them into in our next session. Okay, let's pray together. Father in heaven, been a great session here. I've really enjoyed this. And uh, Lord, as I thought and anticipated, we didn't get through every detail there. And I pray that for those that are particularly interested, that they'll go take a look at verses 8 to 18 and see if they can sort it out. There's a lot of great stuff there and the latter half of 18 as well. Uh, but Father, give us a break. And as we, we look forward to coming back to chapters 19 and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are going to take a quick break, and I had to try what David tried, and I'm going to see what the view is like from up here. Do I look good up here? I don't know if I look as good as you up here. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we're going to take five minutes, go stretch your legs, get a drink, um, and come back. If you wouldn't mind, when you come back, squeeze toward the middle so that folks that are coming in can come in on the sides and uh, make it in and enjoy uh, the next Bible study as well. We'll take five minutes and be right back here.